Let's do some good. Hello, Daniel. Hello, Josh. So this is where we. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Dan. You carry on, Josh. No, I was going to say we're just going to wait a couple of seconds uh, just for a couple of people to join the webinar before we kick off in earnest. Um, but thank you all for joining us today. Um, Dan's going to join. Uh, Dan's going to introduce the uh, the talk. Uh, into joining, I, I can happily interjoin it as well. So I, I, at least I can see everyone's names. There's always it's. It's a very strange process doing these uh, talks because you're kind of just staring into the abyss of nothingness. Uh, can't see your faces, can't see, hopefully, the smiles uh, on your faces. So, um, but I now realize I can see a list of all your names. So at least I know that you exist. Um, so good to see you all. Let's give uh, one minute or so and then we'll start. So. I will probably say this again. Oh, yeah, that's good. I was going to say, but you can always talk to us in the chat so that we know you exist and are real, not just bots. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure whether is it uh, uh, Ben Ben Hudson. You may be a bot with uh, your um, with your PP answers. So. <laughs> Brilliant. All right. Well, shall we kick it off then? Yes. Why not? So, hey everyone, welcome. Um, uh, my name is uh, Daniel, Daniel Ifagan. Um, I'm the creative director at Ardman Animations um, for all the interactive stuff we do. And uh, this is Josh, our game director. Say hello, Josh. Yes, hi, I'm Joshua. I, that is exactly what I am, the game director at Ardman. We'll be getting back into um, uh, these, these, these roles and what exactly they are. Um, a little bit about Ardman. Um, most people know us for people like uh, the faces like Gromit and Sean the Sheep generally know us for kind of putting clay around really, really slowly, taking pictures of it and taking a very, very long time at making animations. Um, but we are also game makers and over the last four or five years have been turning Ardman uh, not just into a film house and a TV house, but also into a game studio. Um, it's important that I uh, say up early that we're recording this session, um, just so that you all know that um, this information's all been recorded. So please take track of that. But I'll pass over to Josh to give you a little sense of um, why, why we've picked what we've picked. Yes, so today we're gonna to be talking a little bit about the kind of people that you will find in a game studio, specifically the sort of the, the very broad range of roles that you can find of, of people working in a studio. And some of these are going to be very obvious to people. Um, and if you're interested in the industry, you'll probably probably know about them. But we're hoping also to talk about some of the sort of lesser known roles that um, that exist. Um, and really, ultimately, I think we, we want to to help demonstrate that there is a really broad range of, of people, both in terms of you know, the types of people and in terms of the jobs in the industry and that there is a place for for all kinds of people in the industry effectively. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about. So we will we're going to talk at you for about uh, 40, 45 minutes. Um, so that will give us 50 minutes or so for questions. Um, please have a think about questions now. There is a system um, where bottom of your screen or right hand side if you change your settings um, where you can see a Q&A button so if you press that and put the questions in that rather than directly in the chat um, it'll be a lot more obvious to us and we'll be able to um, uh, answer them more directly. Um, uh, we may pick up some questions as we go along but we're thinking probably just for flow and ease we'll, we'll leave it all to the um, so uh, we will get back to you before the end, we promise you. Um, and I, I guess another thing important to say, I know everyone always says this, a very known saying, but about there being no stupid questions, um, just reiterating it, please ask absolutely anything. Um, if, you're, if you're missing something, we're the people that have been stupid and therefore uh, you should just ask it. Um, so let's kick off. Uh, we've got quite, we've, we've plucked all these different um, uh, uh, kind of roles out. We've got quite a few that we'd like to get into. Um, and off with probably the meanest, uh, most egotistical tyrants in the whole business, um, the game directors. So, Josh. Thanks, Daniel. You're doing a really good job, by the way. Um, so I'm going to try and 
share the presentation. Um, there we are, seems to be working. Um, yes, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, being a director, but I'm going to kick off first with um, what I used to do, which is being a designer. Um, and I think being a designer in the games industry is one of the most um, misunderstood roles in terms of the fact that not a lot of people know exactly what it means. I often get asked, oh, so you're a designer, do you, do you draw? No, I'm probably one of the most artistically bankrupt people that I know. Um, so a designer's job really is to focus on interactivity. The thing that separates um, a game from a film or any other type of, of media is the fact that the, the, the player is inside the world you've created and they're making choices and they're, they're an active agent in the world. So a designer's uh, job is to think about what the player is doing in the world and think about how it makes them feel, basically. And broadly, we split this into two types of, of, of design role. Um, the first of which is uh, what we call a level designer. And they're the people who put together the actual sort of um, physical aspects of the world and decide what it is, what, what's in the world for the players to interact with. So if you're thinking about um, a game like, like Super Mario, they're the people who decide where the platforms are and how people are going to jump, how many enemies are going to be in a space and how many coins and rewards there, there are going to be in and where they're going to be. Um, so they're a little bit like... Uh, Alex Horn in Taskmaster, you know, creating these sort of fiendish obstacle courses and thinking about how it's gonna make people feel and what's gonna be the most fun. And then on the other side of the coin, we have uh, sort of games, uh, uh, what we're gonna call, so I'm gonna get a, a chart as well so that you can have a look at this. Um, yeah, so then on the other side of the coin, we have uh, what we'd call kind of system designers or um, gameplay designers. And they're, they're concerned not with the world, but with, a, with the tools that we give to people to interact with the, with the world. So if you're thinking of a first person shooter, there'll be the guys who decide, uh, or guys or girls decide what gun, what a gun is, you know, how much damage it does, what the missiles are. Or if you're thinking about a, uh, an X4 game like Civilization um, or Age of Empires, they'll be the ones who think about the economy and they'll spend more of their time sort of in databases and in Excel spreadsheets and doing flow charts and work out the, sort of what the, the systems undergirding everything are. Um, and a director in the games industry um, has a very similar focus, which is how people feel when they play the game, but on a, on a broader scope. So instead of just thinking about the design, they think, you know, what is this game? What are we trying to do with this game? How do we want people to feel when they play this game? And so they're the one that sets out the vision for the game and make sure that everybody on the team knows the vision. And um, this is the, the art, the narrative, the gameplay, all of this. They've got to make sure all of this pulls together and is all pulling in the same direction. So they're a little bit like a creative thermostat on a cooker. You know, they kind of set the oven to the right temperature and then they constantly check whether it's hot or cold enough and, and adjust the kind of the creative levels to keep everyone on, on, the, on the sort of focused on the goal. Um, and yeah, so that the creative director role is, is very similar to that. And Dan's going to explain a little bit more about what that means um, from his perspective. Just give me a sec to cross over. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so yes, yeah, so a creative director, um, uh, not actually on this list um, because we were wondering where to put it, but the, it can mean a lot of different things in a lot of different companies and therefore it's probably less relevant to go into any depth. Um, but I think it's the easiest way that I find to explain it is that I'm ultimately responsible for everything that leaves kind of Ardman's building and in, in particular being interactive creative, dire creative director everything interactive that leaves the building so in the end the creative buck kind of stops and my responsibility therefore spreads across all the various aspects of people that are doing it and so my day-to-day -day is probably more general I end up dealing with a lot more different kind of stuff um, whereas Josh's is more specifically on that game and on that product and getting it to happen but we work very closely together um, but when I was thinking about the word creative director, something, one of the points I really wanted to get across was this idea that creative does not mean the art. It's not that um, uh, creative and drawing or creative and painting go together. Um, and so although I'm creative director, my history is as a programmer. Um, the 10, 15 I had before I actually became a creative director was all about being programmers. And so I thought we could start with um, those as some of the more obvious kind of people that you definitely have to um, uh, work within a game. 
now it's a well-known role i could talk about it for ages i, I love talking about programming um uh, because i used to be a programmer but i will try and keep it very tight because we want to get to the more interesting ones um because there's no surprise behind the fact that to make computer games you need people that manipulate the software um to get it to do what what that we want it to do but they come programmers come in many different flavors uh and in my head i always think of them as two main areas two kind of ends of a spectrum you have the programmers who use codes to make things they that they feel should feel like that. They're kind of all about test by the outcome. It's very much the way that I was a programmer. I wanted my computer to do something. And so I had to learn programming to make that happen. And those kind of people that are more obsessed by the end product tend to be the gameplay programmers, overall or uh, AI coders, even the kind of um, effects coders that are interested in how particles and systems all work together. Um, on the other end of the of this kind of spectrum, you end up with the programmers who code because they love the beauty of code. They, they, they love um, the efficiency and the artistry in the craft of actually coding. And they tend to get into more kind of systems based stuff, dealing with servers, dealing with working, um, dealing with databases, dealing with things that um, are the really complex problems that involve data and code. Um, but every game needs both of these. And every game has a collection of these. And across this spectrum, you also have people that sit somewhere in the middle. I don't want to try and start uh, stereotyping our coders into one box or another. Um, the kind of code languages that people are working, um, if you're into this, you'll, you'll probably know this already, but um, things like C Sharp and C++ are probably some of the more well-known and useful languages uh, you're getting into different parts of it javascript can be quite useful good entry level um, scripting language and then also for a different kind of code a different kind of programmer there's python um, python is used primarily by these pipeline and tool developers so a special mention for them they kind of sit outside of the creation of the actual game but manipulate the tools um, that everyone else is working with, the flow of assets leaving one person's computer and appearing in the game in a different place, um, or the tools that allow one per an artist to make something and it then be sprinkled across the world. Um, so they kind of sit and glue all of this stuff together, which kind of leads us a bit into the artists themselves. So with these two groups, we're, we're trying to kind of get out of the way the two big obvious creators in a game um, but they're, they're really important roles there's a hell of a lot of them in every game so they're a great to get in so we didn't want to ignore them but with artists similarly to programmers there's many many different types you have people who are making stuff in three dimensions the three you have 2d artists that are making either 2d 2d products for a game or loads of 2d if it's a 2d game you have ui artists who are creating the ui and top concept artists who are doing all of the drawing and the world and similarly you kind of get alongside concept artists you get storyboard artists who are helping deliver those moments um, and maybe less known things like fx artists so people that are doing the the smoke or the water or the magic effects so people that are worrying about those kind of uh, uh vfx that run alongside it um and so and so i suppose with those two we've kind of got two of the big obvious lumps of roles out um, but alongside the visual aspect, there's also the audio. And so for that, I'll pass back to Josh. Wonderful. Um, sorry, I'm just going to pop the, sorry, we practiced this. It was a lot smoother when we practiced it than it has now turned out to be, but there we are. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah, could, could have been worse. Um, yes. So, uh, over to the audio side. So, um, this again is a, a fairly core fun creative um, role that's part of you know, making the actual aspect of the game. Um, but it, it is one that kind of flies under the radar, I think, because it's, it's present in so many other, other areas. So there's kind of two key parts to sound and audio in a game. The first one is a sound engineer, and their job really is to paint sound into the world of the game. So that when you're moving around the world, and you're interacting with objects, they make the noises that you'd expect them to. Um, and uh, that's that's kind of their most basic task, but on a more advanced level, there also is a lot that you can do to, to guide players with the audio. You, know, you, can use, uh, you can use audio effects to direct people in different directions, to create atmosphere, 
um, to to uh, it, it can be re- like a really fundamentally very visceral part of how somebody perceives a space is the authenticity of the noise. Um, so it's a really important role, and they work very closely with composers. And composers are um, composers exist in in all kinds of things in film, um, and they basically come up with the the music for the game. But unlike working in film, uh, the composer for a game has uh, has an interesting challenge because a game is not linear in the same way as a film. In a film, you can very carefully sound soundtrack every moment of the film because you know that people are watching it in a specific second by second order, and you know what shot's going to be on screen at what time and what audio, what part of the song will be playing at that moment. So you can create really carefully synchronized emotional moments with the music. Whereas in games, people can can play through it at any pace that they like. Generally, you know, they can be in any space at any time and there'll be an infinite variation of where people are within the game world. So composing in games is really interesting because often you have to think about what we call procedural composition. And that basically means slicing up the uh, the music that you've created into different sections and segments, which are then triggered when you get to different parts of the world. So you're kind of you're kind of creating not a, a linear musical composition, but you're creating a, a sort of a series of things that can be knit together at different moments and taken apart to create the same emotional flows and peaks as you move around the world. So it's a really interesting, um, it's a really interesting and quite technological challenge that that, um, that has emerged in, in something that was previously very traditional. Um, and the, the other role that I want to talk about is, is slightly unrelated, but equally important and equally um, fundamental to the industry, which is QA. Uh, games testers. So uh, I don't know if you guys have seen the hilarious adverts from the 80s that went around, um, which were basically trying to trying to persuade people to become game tested by showing a couple of like surfer bros smoking weed on a couch and playing games. But that, that's definitely the, the view that you find with a lot of people that testing is you know, just like sitting around playing games all day. And in some rare cases, it is like that. But testing, there's a real range in testing roles, and it can go from very, very rigorous, very technical testing where you're going through a game and you're checking that everything works in a technical way. You're che- checking the networking, you're checking how, um, you're checking sort of every aspect of the game rigorously and trying to do things, trying to break it, stress testing, which is very technical. Um, or you can have testing, which almost is, is bordering on design where you're doing sort of experience testing, UX testing, where you're playing a game and you're feeding back directly to the people making the game about how it's making you feel and making suggestions. So it's it's a really varied role that's, that's very important because I think as creators, it's very easy to lose perspective. And I think having having the ability to give it to somebody objective to look at it is um, incredibly valuable. Um, so that's that's QA. And, and, and these, are, these are some of the fundamental jobs. And I think um, the obvious question now that we talked about them is how, how do you get into a role like this? And I think Daniel's gonna give us a, um, an introduction to that from his perspective. Do you mind um, stop sharing, Josh? Because there's no point in me bringing up an image. Of course. Um, Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. So, well, this was more. So, what I did want to say is it was more about how I ended up um, uh, getting into all of this stuff um, because. Because there's no neat way for this stuff to happen no one's life is ever that neat but i suppose i found what i wanted to do a little bit earlier um, than than some do um, i had a reasonably direct route from education into messing around with computers and i know joshua your your route is quite different so we can kind of offer you up both of them as some examples of stuff um, but i thought it was really important to be uh, clear to anyone that's that's younger right now um, listening to this and making these choices that by the time I was 18 I still did not have a clue what to do um, even though things looking back look quite neat um, they were a mess at the time so I think 15 or 16 my plan was to be an architect uh, I think as far as I can remember the main reason is that my mate's dad was an architect cool car um, and building seems pretty good that's about as far as I remember that was the real choice behind what I was doing and because of that I ended up doing physics and art um, at A level, along with music technology, um, and at the end of this, while I was doing this, I, I kind of ended up finding out that architecture was going to be another eleven years, 
And at that time, I wasn't really getting on with college very much. Uh, it was really hard. And so I decided to change tack. I didn't want to spend 11 more years um, in a system which I wasn't enjoying at the time. And uh, time was running out to make a choice. And it felt like I flicked through a book, uh, the UCAS book, which was all the course at the time, saw a picture uh, even flicking through a book, I realise it's quite ancient now, isn't it? Because you would just use the internet. But at the time, I was still flicking through a book um, uh, and decided, I saw a picture of someone messing around with a computer and a weird ball interface. And I thought, that looks cool. And I signed up for this early creative computing course. Um, and I'd say that I wasn't really getting on with college. I think probably a more realistic outcome is that I was really getting on with life. Um, I was drinking when I probably shouldn't have been drinking and smoking when I probably shouldn't have been smoking and skipping classes when I shouldn't have been skipping classes. Um, and, so, uh, and so everything was starting to go wrong um, at my college time. Um, and, but luckily the school was good enough and cared enough about me to write home. My mum cared enough about me to kick my ass and um, uh, and kind of ground me basically. And so I scraped through in the end with a C, D and D, I think on my A levels um, and got onto this course, which was lucky because the course itself within the first couple of weeks is where everything for me fell into place. Um, between the subjects that we started talking about, the computers that were being opened up, the creativity that was being offered by the lecturers who were there, um, by the philosophy that they started talking about, something basically ignited uh, inside me. And it was this idea that there was that you could you create, create magic basically by making computers do thing, things and that somehow I, had, I could be empowered to make them do that. And that was, you know, from that point onwards, it was kind of, it was clear. Um, but up to that point, it was a total mess. Um, and so while I was writing this, I was trying to work out, like, I, I admit that it could be coincidence that I ended up finding the thing that I loved and then having a nice um, uh, kind of uh, a route of uh, impassioned route into a career <laughs> that eventually led me here. But I don't know if that's true. Um, I think it's got more something to do with trusting my instincts, uh, my gut, and be, and also <laughs> being allowed by the people around me to to follow my instincts. Um, and that's something I thought again, it's just like kind of worth putting out there that that things seem to make sense when you look back at them, but at the time they're a total mess. Um, and so to kind of trust your instincts a little bit, if you if you love things, kind of follow them, and they will lead you places. Um, but I mentioned Josh had a alternative kind of journey on his. So Josh, yeah, um, my mine was I think in some ways different, in some ways similar. I think the the similarity is that um, I too didn't really know what I wanted to do. I ended up going to university and studying archaeology uh, because I liked it, um, and because I was too bad at Greek to do classics which is, you know, is what I started off doing. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I had, a, I had a great time at university. I really enjoyed it. And I got to the end and everyone else knew what they wanted to do. And I didn't. I knew that I wanted to do something creative. Um, I'd always enjoyed writing. Um, but I, I ended up just sort of looking around and I'd always played and enjoyed games. And I saw that it was, it was an industry which was really opening up. There were lots of jobs becoming available in, in the creative side. And I just started applying and I was very lucky that a company that made historical video games happened to be looking for a writer at the time. So as, a, as somebody with an archaeology degree who had an interest in creative writing, you know, it, it was a very fortuitous um, occurrence. But I think, I think it, it, was, it was fortuitous. Um, but I think what, what's interesting about it, and, and this, is, this is a little bit what we're going to get into with our next batch of roles, is that I think I'm always amazed by how varied the game industry is and how many games there are about how many different things. And I think what I, what, what I would take away from my background story is that you know, regardless of what your passion is, if you spend time honing your passion and becoming an expert in something, then there will probably be a route into a game or a game or the games industry just based off that. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my, my time, at, uh, my first job at Creative Assembly, just to kind of, kind of explain a little bit more about that, if that's all right with you, Dan. Please carry on. Yeah, pop up the old, the good old screen share. Here we are. So yeah, so now we're going to move into our, our next segment, which is basically um, slightly less obvious, but still fairly obvious. Um, 
roles within the uh, games industry. Um, and this is this is uh, writing and narrative designing. So as, as I said, I I got a job at Creative Assembly, the guys who did the Rome Total War series and the Tiller Total War. And basically they make very in-depth historical titles, which are very nerdy um, and have a lot of uh, historical information in there. Um, and I, I got that job uh, and I came in with a lot of um, a lot of enthusiasm for the industry and also a lot of misunderstanding about what it means to be a writer in the games industry. You know, I thought I thought it would be very, I thought it'd be like being a writer in, in the films industry or, or being a novelist where you would have a lot of creative control and everything would kind of hang on the on the, the narrative of, of what you write. But I think the, the reality of being a writer in the games industry is that it is a very collaborative process. You know, you're not necessarily the one setting the agenda. In some very story-based games you are, but by and large, you are participating with the artist, with the designers to help build a rich world around the characters. So it is more of a, it, it's more of a service role. And I say that in service sounds terrible. It's more of a sort of a collaborative role, like being an artist, you're providing something that is a part of a bigger picture. Um, and I think that that's really great because it for me it was very very illustrative of how collaborative the industry is and i think there's no getting away from that i think the games industry is, is wildly collaborative um and i think that's one of the exciting things is working out how all of these things fit together and that so that led me from being a pure writer into looking a bit more at how everything fit together and that moved me into the space of a narrative designer who sits sort of in between a writer and a full designer in in the sense that they're thinking not only what are the words we're writing, but how does it, how do we deliver them to, to people? And that led me further into pure design. And from there, I am I am where I am now. So that's kind of my my pathway there. Um, yeah, so that's that's my that's my first slightly less expected, but still quite expected role. Dan, what is uh, what's our next one? Let's see, get all this working. So next we are looking at the kind of marketing and uh, oh, I've gone too far. No, I haven't. Here we are. So oh, I have to duck a little. There we are, those ones. Um, so kind of looking around um, uh, marketing, but I think more importantly, uh, the, the in this uh, is the social media and the community teams. Um, if I if I expected, and I have no idea because I can't see you guys, but if I expected uh, you all to kind of be uh, 50, 60 plus, I would feel like I'd have to prove this a little bit or um, explain this a bit more. But I'm going to assume that a lot of you are going to get this if you're either a, a gamer or or just uh, someone that has used the Internet, um, because um, games are all about their communities. You know, it's it, everything around games now is kind of represented and echoed by the communities that surround them. And some of them are out you know, you've just got big games are just have big communities because they're kind of connected. Um, but some are nurtured. Uh, if you take any of the kind of esports games that are out, a lot of people are spending time not uh, naturally having this kind of community of people talking about uh, about your game, but act a lot of work and efforts to help build and um, kind of create that community. I think a good example recently is the Fall Guys um, uh, game that came out, you know, a great community work at the beginning. And so we all knew about it and it really grew from that. And then some, and these are the ones that are almost my favorite because it kind of reveals the great communal brain that is humanity um, and otherwise is output on the internet. Some just like Among Us recently, if any of you have been anywhere near YouTube, um, uh, I don't know, maybe because I've got an eight-year-old son, he's influencing the algorithm, but it seems like everything is talking about Among Us. Um, and then because, kind of really because a few people found it as a great social space to hang out, and that clubhouse grew and grew and grew until everyone wanted to hang out in the same place. And behind all of this stuff, behind all of this activity, um, and all of these communities are these community or social kind of managers, people that are trying to grow communities, keep it under control, are trying to keep everyone friendly, happy of feeding and kind of nurturing um, these, these spaces. And I mentioned the, the clubhouse metaphor, but I think that's quite good. You know, it's like a kind of in charge of some kind of place to hang out, some club or pub or clubhouse where 
use as your metaphor, where everyone's into the same thing. And they're there just to make sure that everyone's kind of being nice to each other um, and is looked after and it's advertised well and people get in there. Um, and so they tend to be the kind of people that get on with everyone. They care about everyone. I know our social um, media team at Ardman, they've got a real desperate love for every single person in their community. And I think that makes a difference. Um, they also tend to have skills in writing, uh, usually have a pretty good sense of humor, uh, both to, to attract and, and be you know, interesting to the people within the community, but also sometimes to reflect all of that crap that you get with internet. So I think that's quite good. Um, and then alongside the actual, the managers of this process, I thought that more and more so we're seeing studios actually have in-house creators. So streamers, or presenters or whatever you want to call them, some form of YouTube or Twitch creators are actually in-house. I know recently we were at Media Monocule, um, the studio that's done Little Big Planet and most recently has been doing Dreams and they have an in-house kind of streaming studio and a full-time who is there kind of being their presenter and grabbing people from across the company and shoving them in front of the camera. So. So this kind of world that was built around gaming has now is blurring where both the, cre the, the nurturing of that community and creation of content for that community is becoming part of the game making and the kind of game team process as well. Um, and that's mine. Joshua, I'm gonna pass back to you. Brilliant, yes. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit, uh, dive into some of the the production side of things here. Um, so, where are we? Bam, brilliant. So, uh, the production side of the industry is basically the side responsible for making sure that the game gets made. Um, at the beginning of the, the project, they'll sit down, um, they'll look at what the game is supposed to be, and they'll try and work out how many people we need to do it, how we're gonna coordinate all of these people, and how, how this thing, this idea is going to become a reality. Um, so being a producer is, is a really interesting role in that it gives you insight into nearly every part of the game making process, you know, to be able to make decisions about how many people you need, how much time they're going to have, you know, where the resources are going to be split. You've got to have a really good insight into how all of those processes work. So they're really, it's a really good role for people who are sort of polymaths and who really enjoy understanding the detail of the craft of the games and who who like thinking about how they can they can optimize things, how they can look at this, this challenge. How do we make this game with the resources we have and work out the best and most streamlined way to do it? But it, it also requires um, sort of, uh, what's the word? D diplomatic skills, I guess is the best way to say it, because you know, no matter what industry you're in, you're gonna find people who have very strong creative views, people who um, maybe aren't necessarily the most social people in the world. And you're going to have to be able to work out how to, to solve problems around the interpersonal problems. Um, so it, it's an interesting role in that it both has opportunities to be very technical and also to be very personal led. And you have, you know, producers really can sit on a spectrum. Some of them are very about the craft and about the planning. And some of them are very much about the people management and the motivation. Um, so it's a really, yeah, it's really interesting from, from that respect. And, and production assistants and financial controllers sit in the same sphere of, of making sure that the practical side of getting the, the game done it is done correctly. Um, and the, the, other, the other sort of production role that I want to talk about, because it often goes unnoticed, is, is localization. So localization is sort of the, the games industry equivalent of a master translator. Because we live in such a global connected world, um, every game we make is consumed by, you know, across the, across, um, hundreds of different territories, all speaking different languages. And not only do you need somebody with a very good grasp of linguistics to coordinate the translation and to do the translation themselves, but you also need somebody to understand the cultural sensitivities. Um, and there's been quite a lot of uh, incidents in the news of where studios haven't necessarily thought about how their content will come across in another culture and in another place. So localization often has to be thinking about that and, uh, and making sure that you don't kind of uh, reproduce content in a way that is offensive to other people. Um, yeah, and so over to, to Daniel to, to talk mind? a little bit about how you would get some of these. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, do you mind um, uh, again, just stopping sharing? Because I don't want to bring anything else up for this bit. Uh, of course, of Thanks course. 
Um, no, it's just really to conclude this bit before we dive into um, how long. 10 minutes left, preferably. And so, and we'll end with a few of the weirder and more wonderful roles um, that you find in some places. Um, but what I thought was interesting about the roles we were just talking about is that, is that they're not really exclusive to the games industry. Um, and you can use that kind of to your advantage as, um, you know, you can start in one industry and, and just build up that skill. Um, and between that skill, showing yourself off, harassing people, um, there is a lot of people talk about luck, you know, being in the right place at the right time. And sorry, this is a bit of a tangent, but I think it's worth saying. Um, a lot of people talk about luck, but I don't, I think there is a lot of truth in place at the right time, but that can be reduced by, or, or increased, I guess. The opportunity can be increased by being in lots of places at the time as possible, um, because then you're a lot more likely to be seen. So doing things like that and having this skill is a way of then being picked up and moved over into the gaming industry. Um, I was thinking about our writers who worked on our first game, 1111 Memories Retold. Um, they are uh, two guys, a duo called uh, Sharky and Long. Uh, they always loved the idea of writing games, um, but they started actually as magicians. They started selling magic tricks in a theme park um, together, and that's where they met each other. Um, but it was from there hanging out, probably bored, uh, stuck in cold, rainy theme parks in the UK, um, trying to sell uh, magic tricks to people, that they both um, became magicians, uh, better and better at doing magicians, but also started talking about writing ideas together. And from that, they it led them, I'll kind of shorten the story because it's a great long story, but they, um, they found themselves eventually getting a gig um, doing the writing for Darren Brown, and they are Darren Brown writers. Um, and then from that, all of a sudden, the games industry was extremely interested when they went to go and speak to them because their passion of writing and their passion of magic had led them to a place where they could, uh, they'd proven themselves as writers, but they'd proven themselves as people that they could manipulate the will of others, um, which is a very useful set of skills to have when you're trying to write. Um, so I guess uh, I'm, I'm kind of uh, rambling, but the point there is that the... Um, that, that sometimes you can just follow the thing that you love and then convert that as a way of getting into the games industry if that's your end goal as well. So now I think with the weirder and wonderful, more, more wonderful roles you may find. Is that right, Josh? Absolutely, yeah. And we're going to launch in with... Um, let me get this up so we can have another look at this. Um, so basically, these are these are roles that um, you know. When I go pretend that they are ubiquitous, you're not going to find these at every studio. But they're some of the more interesting people that we've worked with in our experience in the industry, um, and I think they really go to hammer to demonstrate exactly what Dan was just talking about: the fact that if you are really passionate about something and really develop your craft, regardless of what it is, there is a point at which it intersects with the industry. Um, so I think uh, the first one that we we're going to talk about was psychologist and Dan, you guys worked very carefully, closely with a psychologist on one of your previous projects. Yes, we did. Thank you, Josh. Um, the, yes, so the, um, the first, so if we start with the psychologist, psychologists have kind of been popping up more and more recently in studios. Uh, one of the most high profile ones was part of uh, Hellblade. Um, the, I think it's, uh, I always forget her, her name, Sanua's Sacrifice, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, where they were credited, the psychologist, um, or lead psychologist in the show was credited um, upfront alongside with the directors. The game's hero was struggling with mental health issues. And so the psychologist and their team would have been there, you know, providing kind of honesty to their production, making sure that, that there was a truth to what they were doing um, and that they were sensitive, I guess, to the realities of what was happening to help the kind of creative process. Um, but we've also been working with someone over the last few years um, uh, for, in a slightly different way, in a way of affecting the choices that we make and the choices that we make so so that we can have a positive effect on the world. Um, this psychologist we're working with, she's a lady called uh, uh, Dr. Granite, um, is a um, kind of is on a mission to work out game mechanics that have a positive effect on our mental health. Uh, she runs called the Game for Emotional Mental Health um, and studies kind of the effects. And 
you know, we now know, I don't know if anyone noticed the news story a few days ago about, it was like, oh, everyone was seemed um, totally shocked that games can have a positive effect. Um, but we're fighting against a kind of natural cultural belief that games are just negative. And I think the reality is, is that games can be very powerful. They can have powerful and sometimes um, in certain ways, psychological effect on us. And so I believe we're all starting to realize that and it's becoming more and more important to ensure that, you know, if we have this power at our fingertips, in a positive way. And so we're finding psychologists joining teams. We're definitely trying to bring psych good psychologists um, uh, onto teams so that the choices we're making are kind of um, uh, more rigorous in the way that you know that you're going to create positive effects on people. So that's psychologists. I think Josh, Absolutely. you're going to talk about uh, someone else. Yes. Well, first I was going to um, sort of tack onto the other side of psychology, which which has become very relevant in the industry, which is uh, the sort of the behavioral psychology as a way of informing design. Um, because I think in recent years, there's been a real uh, increase in interest in behavioral psychology, especially in economics, which is basically looking at the fact that um, contrary to, to traditional economic thinking, um, people don't make rational decisions, that the way that you present a decision to somebody can completely change their response, even if you, uh, even if it's the same decision as something else. So you can present the same option to somebody, frame it in two different ways, and they will react to it in a very different way, depending on how it's framed. And this is, be, this is really interesting from a game perspective as well, because when you're thinking about how you present your choices to players, knowing how people behave in, in irrational ways can, can present some really interesting gameplay opportunities. And on the one hand, you can use that to create interesting games and great games. On the other hand, uh, this can also be used to make money. Um, and I think uh, a lot of the companies that run sort of freemium models or free to play games um, have been uh, hiring a lot of uh, sort of behavioral psychologists and economists to work out, you know, how do we get people to spend the most money? And that's not the business that we're in, but it is a part of the industry. And I think the industry needs, is having and will continue to have an ongoing conversation about the morality of that and where we, where we draw the line and what we think is acceptable. Um, but this leads to this leads to just to the uh, the role of the economist the economist 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 I always get that one confused um, and they're they're often used to help advise companies about their their economical model um, I think probably the most famous and interesting example that I can think of is uh, Yanis Varoufakis the um, the pre the uh, finance minister in Greece who was very famous uh, for a while in the kind of the um, near Brexit situation um, who worked before. Uh, he was a uh, government minister. He worked for Steam, helping them inform their business model and work out how to create virtual currencies and trading cards and stuff like that. So um, even sort of pure, pure hard economists, uh, economists, sorry, um, are often used uh, to consult in this. Um, and another another role that we've worked with in the past is historians. And Dan, you guys worked with them most recently. Uh, Dan, you're mute. Sorry. Oh, I was just saying I was slightly um, organized this time and then did that. So, uh, yeah, let's try that better. So, yes, historians. Um, and uh, also just a nudge, I, I put it in chat, but um, uh, please um, start throwing questions at us because we, we are uh, wrapping up very soon. So we'd love to um, we'd love to start getting some of those so that we can be a bit more specific about any questions that you've got. Um, but when we made our first game that I mentioned earlier, 1111 Memories Retold, um, the whole thing was meant to be a really honest and true representation of normal people in World War I. Um, and that honesty uh, only really comes from research. And so we had two historians uh, on our team were there, one from Germany and one from England, because we wanted to ensure a more realistic picture, a non-biased picture of all the kind of various, um, because historians obviously come with various lenses that they put in place and the way that we look at our history. Um, but to us, you know, they were both um, um, inspiration and collaboration because there's nothing more amazing than than history and humans and the truth to kind of inspire some of the things um, uh, out there in the world and inspire you to be able to create art. Also, were you know our checks and balances, so that we could make sure that um, 
that we are being true, as I said, honest, but also non, not too sensationalist in the way we we're doing things. We all, um, with 11-11, that if we could sit down with someone who had gone through World War I on both sides and not feel awkward at any point while um, they were playing the game, if we've just felt like being good to telling their story, um, then we'd done it correctly. I believe that uh, the historians really helped us kind of within that because they helped us understand that moment. Um, but Josh, you obviously must have had historians swell at Creative Assembly, I assume. You're muted as well. I was also yeah. muted, yes. Um, yes, we did. Uh, we worked with a, with a couple, um, depending on which uh, which project we were working, because we tended to hop around periods a lot. But I mean, I, I also, I, I suppose I was in some ways a historical consultant because some of the things that I did my thesis on were also things that we, we did, uh, periods that we set the games in. Um, and that, that was really nice because working in the studio, I was also able to push people in certain directions because a lot of the a lot of the um the total war games had been set around very sort of western centric um visions of history so it was largely around the mediterranean especially the northern mediterranean western europe um but i've managed to do i was lucky enough to do some really interesting courses about um sort of uh east african history um and the arabian peninsula and so uh we you know, I kind of uh, nudged people in that direction and was the historical consultant on a on a particular title that was set there as well. So having people who are aware of the nuances of history um, can be really useful for helping to, um, I, I suppose, broaden the narrative from from the, the pre-existing narrative that, that sort of exists there in the same way that you were saying. Um, and I think we're, we're getting, we want to make sure that we have some time for QA. I can see there's already some questions coming in. Um, one just a quick note before i wrap up uh if we don't answer your question um we've been assured that there will be a way for us to see the remaining questions and to answer them in one way or another so don't be too upset if your question hasn't been answered i think there will be some follow-up um and me and dan will be able to type up answers and they'll be available in one way or another uh, but yeah just just in closing i wanted to say that um we the, the sort of the theme that you may have seen emerging from this talk is that you know the the games industry is very broad. There are lots of different roles and there are lots of different games. There are games about all kinds of things. I mean, last year, um, the one of the most successful titles was a game about building a computer with PC Builder Simulator. So you literally, you sat on your computer and you built a computer virtually. Um, so, I mean, every niche can be successful in the games industry. Um, so I think the, the first aspect of that is, you know, if you want to be in the industry, following your passion, and this sounds very wishy-washy, following your passion can be a very realistic route into the industry. But the other thing that I want to acknowledge in this respect is that while the industry is broad in terms of the types of games it makes, it's not nearly as broad as it could be. You know, there are thousands and thousands of things out there that games haven't been made about. And partly that's because the industry, you know, isn't that broad in terms of the type of people in it. You know, and I think we need to be frank about that. And I think what we what we want to say to anybody to to all of you is that regardless of who you are or what you care about the games industry should be a place that that is an exciting opportunity you know it's a place where you can come and you can make your passions real and you can communicate your passions to the rest of the world even if that game doesn't exist yet and even if that studio doesn't exist yet um so that's that's really what i'd like you all to take away regardless of what you're interested in that you know this could be a place for you to a really powerful creative communicative space for you uh, anything else, Dan, before we hand over to questions? No, no, it was very eloquently finished, I think, there, Josh. So I'll leave, I'll leave. I won't be able to add anything right. useful. Um, I, I have been going through, you. yeah, it's, okay, oh, you're going to ask me a question. I was going to say, because I, yeah, I've been going through the questions while you were talking. So I start with one, um, if that's okay, and, and maybe you this one. Um, but the, really talk about animation even though there was kind of up there and someone was asking in particular about the motion capture side of gaming um when you mentioned those roles so in your experience with your previous games uh how does that kind of animation and motion capture um uh, fit into it yeah sorry really good question and that that was something we neglected i think your specialists will notice that there are lots of lots of roles that we didn't mention, like motion capture. But motion capture is, is incredibly important in games, especially any game about you know, humans 
which most games are about because we love humans. Um, and uh, so all of the all of the games that I've worked on in the past, the games at, at, at Creative Assembly, um, the Unravel 2, which I worked on in Sweden, we used mocap for um, because it's just simply the quickest, most realistic way of producing human animations. Uh, sorry, for those not in the know, mocap is, is motion capture. It's where you put a suit with lots of different bobbles on it and people do something and then you capture an animation from that and use that to animate a character in the game world. Um, and as, as, the, as games become more and more realistic, uh, mocap will become more and more important because the quality of animation will need to be as good as the quality of visual effects. So moving into the next generation where the visual fidelity is higher than it ever has been before, the, having really high quality mocap that can capture all of the nuances of facial movement will become incredibly important. So, yes. Um, and Dan, I've got one to bounce back at you, um, which is, is there, this is from Georgia Madden, and she says, is there much crossover between the film, TV, and game departments, Ardman? There's a very interesting and pertinent question, so. Yeah, no, I, uh, it's a great question. Um, um, within Ardman, pretty much so. So, um, uh, I could talk, I could easily fill up the rest of the time, but I'll keep it reasonably tight so we can get some more questions. But um, yeah, we've set out as a company to specifically um, uh, break down those barriers between our forms of media. Um, we believe strongly that, um, uh, that it's important for all of these skills and uh, these people to kind of be available to every production. And we believe creatively that these story kind of worlds and universes are in people's minds sit independently to whether they're in a film or a game. They kind of have to be bound together. And we also believe that in the future, the edges between all of the forms are starting to break down. Um, I don't think we're too far off having programmers working within film teams um, because of the uh, because the things we're delivering are going to be more interactive. In fact, we talk about the Mandalorian. There was a hell of a lot of programmers working to build the FX systems around the Mandalorian, just as one example. So, so the skill bases between all these industries are becoming blurrier and blurrier. And at Ardman, we are attempting to build ourselves around that very ideal. So shall I pick one out for you, Josh, or have you got one you'd like to answer when you've been looking through? Um, yes, actually, there was one from uh, Abigail Dunn, which was, I was wondering what you both thought the best way to make a start in the games industry would be. Um, and, and I'm aware that actually, while we talked about a lot of these roles, we didn't, we didn't necessarily give any generic advice for what you should do. And, and I, think, I think quite simply the answer is that the best thing to do is to try and work out more or less which one of these roles you think would be best suited for you. It doesn't have to be a final decision, but I think just trying to work out based on your own personality and your own interests, which one of these things would best suit you is the best place to start. And from there, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of very useful content out there, a lot of talks, um, a lot of uh, blogs, a lot of articles about, you know, people sharing their experience of what it's like to be, to do this job. So you can research that and get a better, better experience. And then from there, what I would do is I would see what, what, what skills do I need to prove that I could be useful in this role in a company? And this is easier with, with the more concrete roles like, um, like 3D art, where obviously the best thing to do is to try and develop some skills using one of the industry standard um, you know, 3D art programs like Maya ZBrush um, or programming where learning a coding language is very useful. Um, but it's something that you can do even in the more nebulous roles. So when I knew that I was interested in getting into writing and design, um, I went and I submitted a whole bunch of articles from a design perspective to lots of different games industry magazines. So it's about, it's about trying to work out ways in which you can demonstrate the skills that are commonly used in the industry beforehand by yourself. And um, you know, there, are, there are loads of different things you can do. You can do courses, um, you can read about it, you can make your own games. There's a lot of tools that are out there that allow you to mod pre-existing stuff. So take something like Skyrim and build your own mini game using their tools. Um, and there's a lot of what, yeah, so there's a lot of ways of, of kind of getting a feel for it that way. Uh, anything to add there, Dan? Or yeah, like I mean, it's, I think you're right. Um, the, uh, going back to that right place, right time thing, you know, in as many places as possible and obviously these days it's um, even more confounded it's, they're all digital spaces but being in places 
um, being on sites, being on creative portfolio sites, or um, turning up at game jams is one thing you didn't mention, but we kind of, you know, we love every time someone comes through the door and has been going to lots of game jams um, uh, and trying stuff out lots, um, and then they come and talk to us, I instantly kind of focus on them because um, it shows that they that people care and it shows that they've already kind of broken the back of trying to do that stuff. The only other thing I'd add is that there's something about the fundamentals when, uh, so if you take programming, obviously, the fundamental of coding is important and it doesn't matter too much about having specific skills it just about there is something about the base of it and then similarly with drawing and with animation i would say there's something about um the core kind of aspects of being able to draw so people that turn up and have life drawing examples and have kind of all those things as part of their life there's those specific kind of underlying deeply underlying um skills are also great fundamentals to build up as well yes Five minutes. and one thing that i forgot to mention that I'd just like to add there is that um, we've talked a lot about passion and we've talked a lot about creativity and enthusiasm. And I think that all needs to be there and it needs to fuel anything that you do. But I think one of the most important things that somebody will look for when you're coming to them to apply for a job is that you understand your craft and the impact of it. Because I think the games industry is full of a lot of people who love games and some people allow their personal tastes to um, basically warp their judgment effectively so they they come into the industry thinking you know what do i like what do i care about and they don't necessarily understand how their their decisions are impacting the product that they're working on and i think it's really important that you know that whatever you're you're doing whether it's programming or design you're thinking about how it's going to impact someone else so if, it, if it's visual you're not just painting things that you like you're as you're painting things that you like you're learning what makes it effective and what makes it the most power what allows you to most powerfully communicate it to other people so that's that's one thing I'd add. But we should move on to another question. Sorry. Um, should. Have you got one? I've got that you'd a quick like, one. Or? So I'm going to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'll, 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 I'll do a quick one. Um, uh, uh, you're right that it is not a silly question. This is from anonymous attendee. Um, uh, so uh, um, does the game industry use Foley sound artists? to come up with their various sound effects? And the answer is yes. I mean, obviously there are huge libraries now of sound. Um, uh, so it to, um, to the, the smaller productions will tend maybe to kind of go for that. I know of someone that, yeah, is using a kind of a virtual um, gym of all of the different things that might happen in the game, all the different surfaces, all the different um, spaces, all the different kind of punches and effects and all those things, while then also being a Foley artist. So playing the game and they've got their Foley thing there and they're just slowly building it up. So it's still very much part of it. Brilliant. Um, all right. Uh, one one question from Siddharth Patel. Sorry if I, if I mispronounced that. But uh, what roles will be more important in the VR side as the VR side of gaming improves? Uh, that's an interesting question because I think the um, VR is still, uh, well, the last project that I worked on was a VR project. And VR is still developed in a very similar way to the traditional games industry and is still in many ways in debt to the traditional games industry. I think what, what's going to become more important as we go on is thinking about how we can craft um, game experiences to VR in a much more meaningful way. Because a lot of VR experiences you'll see are basically just conventional games in 3D. And that that can work in some games, but there are a lot of problems related to, to movement, related to perception, related to the interactivity of the spaces around you that mean that they're not actually a great fit. And I think I think as we as VR starts becoming more and more advanced, I think there'll be a lot of stuff around the, the peripherals in terms of the way that we are able to interact with the space around it. So there'll be quite a lot of technological and psychological thinking as we move into VR, which I think will be really interesting. Sorry, to give you, um, I was just going to say, to give you an example, we've done a number of VR productions as well, like in the early days. And our people that came from um, kind of uh, contemporary theatre backgrounds who understood um, uh, those kind of immersive theatre structures were actually better than, say, people that came from cinematic or gaming backgrounds um, because in terms of the creative side, because they understood what it was like to build an experience in a physical space. And once you put that VR helmet on right now, our experiences are very much like being plonked in a physical space. So that's the other thing. Now we're down to a last, I don't even know if we've got a minute left. Do you think we can get one, one more done? 
What have you, have you got? Should we do a quick fire one each? Why don't you do? Okay. How did you go from programming to become a creative director? And and I'll do. Is there a job mostly for story ideas and story? Okay. Well, so I um, it. way of explaining that in a very short amount is that while I was also um, doing many other things, I was a bit of a weeder dealer, so I kind of set up many things that all eventually failed. Um, and I um, but I but I was dance programmer so as i was programming i was dealing with all the other things um with someone that you normally would so i kind of kind of got interested in all the rest but programming was my way in um and eventually because i got to meet people because i kind of built up a community around me um because i proved myself as someone that could solve problems i got an opportunity to go in and um uh, a try out for this role at Ardman. did a two-week stint and i just suddenly leaped from um wheeler dealer stroke programmer to creative director, I was quite shocked. Um, but I, because the person who knew me knew me, they kind of trusted me. So again, like very much being right place, right time. But I'd I'd been around a lot in Bristol, so so people, knew me, and that helped. I think ha people trust me more. So. And Josh, yeah, I, one last I think one. I just second that by saying that. No, I, I I don't think we have time for another one. I think I would just second that by saying that for me as well. I think what allowed me to make that jump from from designer to, to director was really just pushing into the other areas and and trying to get involved in as much stuff as possible and thinking about what I did, thinking about how what I did impacted the rest of the game and trying to to learn and have input in the rest of it. So I think really just being very proactive and showing that you have a broader understanding of how everything fits together is is really important. And I think that's probably us. Thank you guys so much for coming. Um, sorry, yeah. go ahead, Dan. Sorry that we couldn't answer all the questions, but um, no, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I'm slightly asked. But sorry, couldn't ask all the answer all the questions. But we will, um, uh, we will endeavour to try and get something useful up. Um, otherwise, thank you so much. It means a lot, actually, to have um, uh, people come and give attention. Um, I hope we've been in some way useful. So, goodbye. Brilliant. Goodbye. <laughs>